next. Tragedy strikes. Accidents happen. Be there when the calls come in. It's back-to-back -back episodes of Rescue 911. Next on Discovery Health Channel. Today on Rescue 911. Then, sir, are you okay? Respond to me. Passengers attempt to save a choking man by performing an onboard operation on Rescue 911. <laughs> On May 28, 1990, more than 100 passengers boarded a plane bound for San Antonio, Texas, and settled in for what they thought would be a pleasant trip. But less than halfway through the flight, at 35,000 feet above the ground, all that would suddenly change. The co-pilot on U.S. Air Flight 179 was Leonard Jessup. For me, I had had better than 9,000 hours of flying time at that point. I'd never had any type of emergency at, at all in my flying experience. We were westbound en route to uh, San Antonio. We were probably about 100 miles east of Memphis. The plane had leveled off at 35,000 feet. Meals were being served, and flight attendant Dan Matthews was passing out beverages. Anything with lunch today, sir? I was serving a passenger sitting in a window seat, and the lady in the row right behind him calmly said to me, sir, I don't think my husband's breathing. He was darkish gray, kind of hunched over. He was not making any motion. Ladies, I need you to up and out of your seats right away. Unbuckle your seatbelt. From the symptoms that were taught in our initial training, I knew it was total airway obstruction. Sir, are you okay? Sir, are you okay? Respond to me. Respond. Using the skills he had learned in his flight training, Dan immediately began performing the Heimlich maneuver. Respond, sir. I'm doing good. Keep going. It's still blocked. Are you, sir? It's still blocked? It's still blocked. The abdominal thrusts were not working because I could not get him up high enough to get the force. So I started doing chest compressions. Come on. Don't quit. Keep going. You're doing good. That's it. Is it coming out? It's not coming out yet. No. I'm not quite sure I could say he was dead or alive at that point, but I knew we better get on the ground or we better get something done here right away. The victim's 79-year-old wife had been sitting next to him. It happened so suddenly. And before I knew what was happening, the stewards took me away so that I didn't realize it was as serious as it was. First class flight attendant Mike Sullivan notified the captain and the co pilot there was a medical emergency on board. Dan started the Heimlich maneuver. The guy's unconscious and non responsive. Okay, well, We're not at liberty to leave the cockpit, right so uh, a medical emergency is uh, left up more to the discretion of the flight attendants. Let us know what we can do to help. Keep us up there. We'll do. Up ahead, there was a commotion on the airplane. And I turned to Eddie, and I said, Eddie, I think something's going on up ahead. I said, I'm going to go up there and see if I can help him out. He's fine, doing good. doing good. He's fine, sir. I'm a doctor. Doctors Eddie Sanders and Charles Plotkin, two anesthesiologists, happened to be on board. I gave several attempts at a Heimlich maneuver and didn't feel as though I could get anywhere. It had been four minutes since the victim's airway was blocked. So I said, well, if he's choking, the Heimlich doesn't work. I figured a back slap would work well for him. Anything come out? But we did that, and the situation didn't change at all. I did a quick finger sweep. There was nothing there, and I attempted mouth to mouth. Try and give him another breath. I can't. I can't move anything. Was unable to move any air. That is not characteristic of successful mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. I should have the sense that I could breathe easily from my lungs into his. I tried to check a pulse on the patient, a, a carotid pulse, and, and felt absolutely nothing. Okay, he's still not breathing. He was 
as about as blue as a pair of blue jeans. He was totally lifeless. If this guy had been in my operating room, I would be really worried and I'd be calling out for help. They were more than 15 minutes from the nearest airport large enough to land the plane. We're running out of time. We know what needs to be done. We don't have the equipment. You have to move some air or nothing is going to be successful from this point on. And at that point, I said, OK, we're going to have to cut this man's neck. We're going to have to get a surgical airway. We're gonna, Eddie, we're going to have to do a surgical airway. Get me a knife. Somebody got a knife? I need a knife. Does anybody have a knife? There was not a moment to wait. If I don't do this, this man is not going to make it. He's going to be dead. I have nothing to lose here. From somewhere on the plane materialized a Swiss Army knife. Open it for me. Give me the big blade, please. There's no time to sterilize anything. If the man lives to get an infection, you've done a great job. Hold him real still. OK, I got it right there. We're going to have to put something in here, Eddie. We got a pen, please, a tube of some kind. We asked for a pen to give us some ability to provide a little bit of oxygen to this patient. Does this work for you? Yeah, that's great. Can you just take that apart? Give me the bottom part, please. I held my finger in that hole. But as I did that, I felt something against it, and instinctively, I just pushed it. The obstruction came out his mouth, and it appeared to be a very large, partially chewed piece of meat. He began to breathe a little bit, and it appeared that his heart had restarted. And then I'm faced with a whole different problem, and that's the problem of bleeding. It's something I had not anticipated. It just uh, started coming out. It came out in a big gush. More blood than I've ever seen. I work in an operating room every day of my life. Crossed my mind at that point that we had saved him from the initial problem, but he's now going to bleed to death. We needed to land the plane right then. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a medical emergency on board, and at this time we're going to need your cooperation because we're going to be diverting and landing in Memphis. And I'm used to dealing with airway problems, but I'm not used to dealing with bleeding problems. The only way I know to stop bleeding is you put pressure on it. And I realized that maybe if I've squeezed around the loose skin that's in the neck area here, and bring it together around the pen cap, then I could at least put pressure on whatever was bleeding. The gentleman at that point began to flail around a little bit to move, to fight. My concern is that he was going to stand up and probably rip everything out of his neck. It literally took both of us to try to keep him from moving. shows have been geared towards guys and I say why should they have all the fun say goodbye to honey do list because on my show honey you do it yourself don't miss tool belt diva Friday at 9 oh just watch my show Papish Discovery Home Channel gotta watch it Discovery Home Channel is available 24 hours a day on digital cable and satellite call today and ask for Discovery Home Channel starting to regain almost his normal color. And we actually got him to squeeze my hand to command. And that's all I wanted. That means the brain was working. When the plane had got to a stop, by that time, the door was open and there was an ambulance there. Paramedics packaged the 89-year-old victim for transport to the hospital. We were able to get the man out of the airplane very quickly. The paramedics carrying him in the stretcher with my hand still on his neck holding the pressure until we got to the ambulance. And at that point, I could not hold my fingers like that anymore. I couldn't. They had gotten to the point where they're so tired, I couldn't hold the tight pressure. When I let go, there was no bleeding. En route to the hospital, Dr. Plotkin spoke with one of the paramedics. I said, do you come out here often for these sort of things? He says, usually it's to come out and get somebody off a plane, but usually they don't survive. And I kind of felt a little bit good that time, because I said, well, not today. Not today. Not with this man, OK? This man's going to make it. 
after it was over. There was just this tremendous rush of emotions and utter amazement that we're on the flight, we're side by side. This happens, we both see it. We're able to respond as a team. It's one of the most incredible coincidences that I could ever imagine. Jack Sykes completely recovered. Two years later, he looks back on that day from his home in Yorkshire, England. My last memory was that I was dying, but I wasn't in distress, I wasn't in pain, and I felt if this is dying, well, there's nothing to it. Jack will never forget the two strangers who saved his life. I haven't spoken to them, but we've had correspondence with them, and I'm deeply grateful to them, deeply grateful. Jack continues to enjoy the things he loves most in life. I've asked myself many times what I was saved for, what is there for me to do? I think sometimes there's nothing for me to do, and then I think, yes, there is. I have to keep my wife happy. We've been married 44 years, and are we still happy? Yes, 100% as we were when we got married. You know what it says, Jack? Wales, a small country, has a literature which is among the oldest in Europe. Every night before I go to sleep, I say, I love you in case I die in the night. So that she will remember that my very last words were, I love you. Next, step inside the command center where the calls for help are answered and meet the real-life heroes who save lives. Stay tuned for another episode of Rescue 911. Next on Discovery Health Channel. Real life. Medicine. Miracles. Mr. Shapiro, step out of the car, please.